I'm Dylan Radigan. I've interviewed nearly every CEO and most world leaders during the past 25 years. And now I'm bootstrapping, I'm turning my attention to the new CEOs and the irrepressible entrepreneurs leading the next generation of innovation in the world. Welcome back to Tasty Live. I am Dylan Radigan. It's time for another episode of Bootstrapping. Our guest today, Jay Bang, the company, Future Cardia. Jay's the founder and CEO. They launched it in 2019, raised $8 million on their seed round. They're in their growth phase, if you will, the long-term vision, monitoring uh, patients, heart patients, suffering from cardiac diseases. Basically, Jay, my understanding is that you believe with better data that you can prevent... Um, you can reduce the number of visits to the hospital for heart issues. I mean, that's that, that my sidewalk yep. version of your business. Um, yep, absolutely. So first of all, why does better data help prevent uh, visits to the hospital? Yeah. So these patients already have a cardiac condition. So there is no way to monitor these patients right now. So you have the wearables, are, which are really good for short term, but for long term, they're not being used because uh, the, the location of the device placement changes all the time the compliance is a big issue the data is a big issue so that they're not being used so only way right now is to implant it inside the heart and that's how we're doing it that's the gold standard so um uh, we're improving uh, so you're so you're saying right now the only heart data we're getting is you know from a wrist monitor or even if it's a it's something outside of the body basically for short term yeah for yeah. short term that and, is and, and, but what but what you're developing is something that goes inside the body is that correct right. Right. In, inside the patient's heart specifically? No, uh, under the skin. Under the under the skin anywhere on the body? Oh, uh, just under the chest right here, right where the heart is. So near the heart. So it's yeah. under the skin and what is the what's the pre, what's the difference between being under the skin near the heart mm-hmm. versus anywhere else outside the body? Well, outside the body doesn't give you the cardiac data. Uh, not a, not an accurate one. It just so gives me the awesome. pulse or it gives me the blood oxygen, something like things that we, we all know. Right, right. And so what additional data are you getting by inserting this under the uh, skin on the chest? We're getting something called ECG, electro uh, cardio, cardiogram. So we're getting the electrical activity of the heart. Also, we're getting a heart sound, the mechanical uh, aspect of the heart. So uh, just like you're going to a doctor's office, they listen to your heart, uh, they do EKG. Exactly the same thing, except we're doing it all day long, every day, for, for two, three years straight. So the the, pre- the premise behind your business is you're not going to put this in every person in the world, obviously. But no. when someone, someone's diagnosed with a heart condition of any kind, at the point, once you're on that list, which no one wants to be on that list, but once many people are, and once you're on that list, then by de- then your goal would be to have everybody on that list have one of your devices. Right, absolutely. So right now, atrial fibrillation is a big, big problem. Uh, I, I believe almost 10 million Americans are suffering from that. And then heart failure, that's another 6 million patients that are suffering from that. So the gold standard for them uh, right now is to implant it under the skin and monitor the data or implant it inside the heart and monitor that, monitor that data. So that is the only gold standard right now. So we're actually... Uh, uh, leveraging existing technology, existing implant procedure, existing patients and physicians, and bring a, a, a superior product. And, and what's novel about your product? In other, what's the new thing? If you're if you're leveraging all this legacy capacity, how what are you in? What's the new application? Sure. So we're making things a little bit simpler for them. Um, uh, the ECG, the data is a lot cleaner. Uh, we have what we call it longer vector. So we see a, a bigger picture of the heart, so to speak, with ECG. And we're getting a, a clearer heart sounds, which is not available right now. And also the connectivity. So wireless connectivity is very difficult thing to do from imagine uh, your device connecting with a, a phone or your you know, other external device, and it has to communicate. And that takes a lot of energy and a lot of technology. So we bring the... Uh, uh, of, seamless connectivity to the uh, uh, to the device. And because you can recognize either as a mechanic a mechanical sound that is not a good sound or or you recognize an electrical pattern that's a, that is a negative you know indi- a negative indication sure. 
what act I'm assuming basically what you're going to say is why well, I have earlier or er, earlier de early detection, right? Is what we're talking right. about. Yeah. So we're looking what at trending actions, changes. And what actions can you take with early detection? Sure. So trending changes. So if you were to take a momentary picture of uh, heart and your heart today and a week from now, it, you can't really tell what's going on because it's, there's so many things are changing, but with our device, because it's implanted and having a, uh, uh, exact uh, point of data acquisition, we can see a trending changes. So if the heart, let's say heart is getting uh, uh, flooded with fluid and then heart sound is slowly changing, then we can see that um, uh, the what we call trending changes over a long period of time. So it's not something that you see a picture today and tomorrow and say, okay, this is what's going on. But with the chronic patients, you know, one week, two weeks, three weeks, even months will give us a trending um, um, analytics of that patient. And then what is the pattern? I, how do I, what, obviously we know what a traumatic heart intervention looks like and no one right. likes to think about it. What are you able to do to prevent that? In other words, when you sure. recognize a pattern, that, like, I don't want to have an open heart surgery. I don't want to have no, an open no. heart surgery. Right. right. And I'm so that was the reason I I'm like, oh, I'm excited to have this future cardio thing implanted in me because I have it and it's going to reduce the probability that I'm going to have to have a, a one of these super invasive, super traumatic interventions. And the alternative to those interventions is what? In other words, what does early detection allow you to do? Sure, sure. So let's start with the heart failure first. So heart failure is a condition where the heart doesn't pump well. So imagine a patient not feeling all that well. So how do you know when you are sick or sicker or really sick? You don't. So you, you don't you don't know what to do. So these patients are like, what do I do? And the doctor says, I don't know what to do either. Go to the emergency room and we'll figure it out. And even if it's a false alarm in the emergency room, they often get admitted to the hospital just because they are heart patients. So what we're doing is uh, as uh, as they slowly deter deteriorate or what we call decompensation, so the heart function is slowly declining. And before the patient crashes down, we'll intervene and usually do a simple medication adjustments or a simple follow-up. That's all they need. Instead of going to the emergency room and uh, incurring $36,000 in medical bills. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the physical trauma and all the other horrors. Inconvenience, yeah. inconvenience. And imagine if you're a patient and you go to the ER and they say, oh, nothing's really wrong with you. And then you're like, well, it's embarrassing. This is the third time this month I'm coming here. And they keep telling me nothing's wrong with me. And the patient may feel really sick, but physically or heart-wise, they may not be that sick. So that's where the patients are constantly stuck between the uh, uh, real emergencies and false alarms. And mm -hmm. on the other side, we have patients that are so embarrassed about doing this, they wait it out. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you're getting really, really sick and you wait it out, then you're in even bigger trouble. Mm -hmm. And so how far along are you with the actual device? Yeah, so we did, we are in two years of research and development. We have the device already built and it is uh, what we call patient ready, meaning we are able to implant this in patients. So we will have a, a human implant in you know, Europe, uh, middle of this year. That will be your first human implant will be 2023 yes. this year. Yeah. Uh -huh. And what have you been using pigs so far to test it in pigs? Yep. Yep. And that is the uh, standard of uh, yeah. um, standard procedure in our industry. Yeah, I'm aware. Um, and and how has the performance been in pigs? Uh, pig is the, the most closest thing to we can get. So what we call the uh, sensing and detection. So we are able to sense all the arrhythmias um uh, all the uh, uh bad rhythms slow rhythms fast rhythms we got that um uh, we also did a long term implant and we also did a, a heart failure implant so a four implant so far has been very successful and put that into perspective most implantable bioelectric devices do not do four implants in one year they're lucky to do one maybe two so we're moving very fast yeah, no kidding. I, I, are you associated with any research universities or is this being done purely as a, a medical device startup without a, a research partner? 
Yeah, both. So as a medical device company, we work with the uh, the top top universities in the world. Um, uh, we are able to do it there, and we also do it at a private facility. Mm -hmm. The obvious question, just in, on the news cycle, and forgive me, but obviously there's this sort of famous, the most famous heart attack in America right now was on Monday Night Football the other day. Right. Um, probably impossible. I, my sense is nobody really knows anything at, at this point in terms of what exactly is going on there. Right. But, but the, to the degree to which someone like that had your device, I guess your device would show if there, if if his heart had any um, unusual or bizarre or unhealthy behavior, your device would show it. It's just not clear whether that, whether this, in this particular instance, that was the case. Right, right. It's hard to say. And, you know, it's a freak accident. And uh, being in this industry, I know cases where uh, uh, a boy get hit by a baseball and then he goes into a similar situation. And I, I know a couple of cases where a, a basketball player had a collapsed in the, with the chest with a with a direct blow to the chest or just not even just just collapsing really? so we we do know that and even with car accidents we get we have these incidences so it's a very unfortunate and a freak accident but mm -hmm. for patients like that uh my device will not bring value to them um mm -hmm. uh patients after the event like that then we can implant the device and record the data and see what we can help but Prior to that, a healthy young individual, they will not need devices like this. Mm -hmm. Who is your competition? Uh, the big ones. So Medtronic uh, is working on something very similar to ours. Okay. Boston Scientific and Abbott. So these are three companies that are, uh, you know, combined probably in the uh, fifty billion dollar market between yeah. three. Of them. So what makes you think that with eight million dollars in seed funding, you can compete with the biggest medical device companies on earth? Yeah. So our goal is not to go after every single doctors, every single patient in the country. So we're going after high volume uh patient and physicians and medical centers and bring value to them. Only way to win this game is to chip away, knock on doors, and bring value to patients and physicians, uh, make their life easier, uh, bring cleaner data, uh, uh, bring a device that connects. So imagine getting something like this and they can't tell what's going on because the, the connection isn't there or the device is uh, not sensitive enough to catch the events. Mm -hmm. So you're frustrated as a patient and say, I just went through all this procedure and now they're asking me to put on an Apple Watch to confirm what's going on or, put on an EKG machine to confirm what the device is not telling me. So those are the kind of things that we're going to minimize and bring value to the uh, patients and the uh, uh, physicians. So how, how much time do you think exists between now and when you would have an FDA certified medical device commercially? Yeah. Available? Yeah. So first in human is the goal. So we'll implant that in the middle of this year and then we'll gather the data, submit to the FDA, hopefully uh, end of the year, beginning of next year. Really? It's called I mean, 510K. It's a class two, okay. short rate free process. So I've been in the implantable medical device industry for over 20 years, okay. all class three. So those takes five to seven years of a clinical trial to get there. Ours mm -hmm. do not. Ours is about six months to a year. Okay. Just, is it, so it's, but it's not a class one. I'm familiar with the class one 510K. Right. This is class two 510K. Correct. Which so is class one would be, um, I would say class one would be like a, Medical gloves, uh, yeah. syringes. So class two would be I, like, I, IV uh, bags, things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or MRI machines, yeah. EKG machines, X-ray machines. Those are class two. Class threes are life-saving devices, defibrillators, okay. pacemakers, uh, brain modulation. Those type. What about things like eye? Are eyeglasses a medical device? Are yes, it kind? is. I I want to say it's hard to say, but I I believe eyeglasses probably fall into class one or class two. As a as a five ten k, are you concerned about rejection? In other words, you're putting an outside, you're putting a foreign object. Right. Let's assume everything works. It's beautiful. It's monitoring. It connects. It feeds the data. Everything you say turns out to be true. I still need the human body to have a, a comfortable relationship with a foreign object that is inside of it. Absolutely, absolutely. And that was How the you navigate that. 
Yeah, so our device is built just like pacemakers and defibrillators. Over, I think, 10 or 15 million patients already have these type of devices. So the material is called titanium. All, all implantable devices in modern implantable devices are made of titanium, same titanium. So the, uh, the rate of rejection is almost zero. Wow. And all the materials that we use is the exact same material that is being used for all implantables. So it, that is not unique to us, but it is something, the standard of care for all of us. And, and so your goal, I'm presuming, is to get through this first in human trial, get this data, then raise some more money on that data? Yeah. Or, not, or will that be necessary? Uh, we'll see. But traditionally speaking, um, acquisitions usually, it's hard to say, but it, it becomes very attractive when we achieve human implant status, just because Absolutely. it's inherently more difficult than anything else out there. So of you can course. build you can build a, a really nice ECG and heart sound device and put it on the patient's chest or put it on the wrist. Anybody can do that. I mean, when I say anybody, literally a high school kid can build that device, put it, put it on patient's body, but because it doesn't hurt the patient, right? But there's a, probably 500 companies that are doing that right now. But implanting is just inherently different. It's just completely different beast. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's only three companies out there doing it. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, the end game is that you get bought by one of those big three companies? It's hard to say. Uh, uh, the numbers of that, ha the chance of that happening is pretty high. Uh, chance of uh, going IPO is also there, uh, mm -hmm. especially with the current market. Uh, a lot of the startups are able to go IPO without the help of the uh, uh, acquisition. So that, to me, is a market dependent. Uh, it's, it's not dependent on what I want. It depends on how With well the market we market offers. Yeah, yeah. And, and so the end and, of the and day, that offers. Yes, sorry. And it offers is usually in the billions. Yeah, it's no, not, of course. Yeah, yeah of it's course. not 10, 20, or hundred. No, no, million. you're talking about a standard of care for the heart. You're in a, you're like in a big binary. It's either going to be worth nothing or it's going to be worth an, a huge amount. It's, it's very right. binary. Um, right. What is the biggest human benefit? Let's assume that you are on the, on the positive side of that binary um, and forget the economics of that. What is the greatest human benefit of this technology? How does this change people's lives? Sure. Um, uh, like heart failure is a good example. I mean, imagine, you know, the anxiety of not knowing if you are sick enough to go to the ER or not, you know, that, that stress. So it, well, it would, is, it, would it, is it too brazen to say it would prevent a certain number of heart attacks because through, through early detection? Well, it's a heart attack is a little bit different than heart failure, but uh, a heart failure event, absolutely. And that is the. That it, the, will, that it will reduce the, the number of people that experience heart failure. Or heart failure related hospitalizations. Got it. That 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 the most that that the story of success of this product is a is a is a material reduction in heart failure or heart failure related um, hospitalizations. Absolutely, and that is a forty billion dollar problem right now. Biggest, yes. it's a bigger than uh, cancer and AIDS I know. combined. So if you look I'm, at, I'm an advisor to a company that's doing a standard of care stent for heart regen. I'm very familiar with the domain, and yeah, so the yeah. economics are massive, and, yeah. all, and the need is massive. But it's also extremely difficult and very competitive, and all the pigs and all the things we've been running with this business that I've been advising. They've been running pigs for ten years, mm -hmm. so you know I, I I feel bad for all the. Oh, there's a lot of bacon out there, Jay. That you know, there's a lot of lot of lot of lot of you guys are making a lot of bacon. No, that's a, yeah, that's a tough one. But the, um, um, from a patient's perspective, yeah, it's like, I, I know patients that are just frustrated and physicians too. I mean, what do you do? You have no data. The patient mm -hmm. calls you and says, what do I do? Is it go to the ER, you know, when turn, turn yeah, on your Apple watch. Yeah. And even that's not going to help because it, we've shown yeah. that have shown that it's completely useless. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you can't bring the patient to the office because you don't know how sick the patient is. Right. Mm -hmm. You send the patient to the ER. Somebody has to go and watch their patient. So ER docs are not going to send that patient home. Mm -hmm. And the hospital doctor is not going to send that patient home. So mm -hmm. the patient is staying in the emergency room or the uh, uh, cardiac unit for at least a day, just so that somebody can say, you can go home next day. Complete mm -hmm. waste of patient's time and money and mm -hmm. the physician and healthcare expenditure. So we can minimize that and 
find out if the patient's really sick, yeah, absolutely go to the ER, we'll take care of you. Mm -hmm. If you're not sick, if you're not that sick, come to the uh, office and we'll, we'll uh, manage the medications and uh, uh, control that uh, uh, decompensation. So the mm -hmm. problem with the ER is not that they decompensate and they recover fully. They decompensate, they recover maybe 80%. Mm -hmm. And then they're, they're prone to more hospitalizations of course, I'm familiar. It becomes a permanent down. condition. Exactly. You never get back to, you never get back to hundred percent. Especially when you have a true decompensation stage. And that's mm -hmm. why in heart failure, over 50% mortality within five years of diagnosis. As a result of all the scar tissue and the limited functionality after the fact. Right. Um, future cardia is the business. And one year from now, if Jay Bang has his way, He'll be on his way to a class two, five, 10 K with successful results this year. Uh, we'll find out. I'll, let's check in in a year. Let's talk next January, Jay, see how this Sounds goes. Great. All, All right. right. Thank you, All right. Best of luck. Congrats on everything so far. Yeah. Jay Bang, the, uh, the, your founder and your CEO, Future Cardia, the business. We'll talk to him in 12 months. You're watching Tasty Live. I am Dylan Radigan. This is Bootstrapping.